we are proving uh, my hill narrowed theorem and uh, that theorem says that the following three statements are equivalent and we propose to prove this theorem by first showing 1 implies 2, then 2 implies 3 and then 3 implies 1. Last time we completed the proof of 1 implies 2 and just to remind ourselves what the proof was, we, we, we start with the assumption that L is regular. L is regular means there is a DFA M which accepts the language L and then we considered R M for that machine M. We defined the equivalence relation R M last time and we found that time the R M the equivalence relation R M for M accepting L, we found that of course, it was an equivalence relation and R M that equivalence relation was right invariant, we proved that and it had finitely many equivalence classes. So, therefore, it is a finite index and of course, the language is the union of some of its equivalence classes. So, 1 implies 2 we can say proved by R m right, just considering the equivalence relation R m. Now, we would like to prove 2 implies the statement 3. Here we start with the assumption that L is such a language satisfying the conditions here and then we would like to show that the equivalence relation R L for this language is of finite index. We defined R L last time and it was like this. Again R L is a equivalence relation on sigma star. So, it relates two finite strings uh, you know in sigma star. This relation is pairs of such strings and we said that x r l y if and only for all z in sigma star maybe I will write it here. So, when will x r l y hold? It will hold only when for all z. So, take any string z in sigma star, then you take the two strings x z and y z right by concatenating z first to x and then to y you get these two strings. Now, you see what are the possibilities x z in L and y z in L, x z in L, but y z is not in L, x z is not in L and y z in L and both x z and y z both of them are not in L right. These are the only possibilities that can happen when you get these two strings either both in the language or exactly one of them in the language or none of them in the language. Now, for x r l y to hold these two cases must not be there. So, you see for two strings x and y 
if it is the case that for every z, when you form these two strings x z and y z, either both of them will be in the language or both of them will not be in the language. Only in such a case, we will say that x is related to y. How do we check whether x is related to y? Of course, here is the definition, but that is not the point right now. The point is to understand the definition. First of all, let us quickly see that R L is an equivalence relation. The reflexivity and symmetry are quite obvious. In case of reflexivity, you need to check the condition for x z and x z. Of course, x, you have only one string x z and so therefore, the conditions will be true. This things that we have written. Symmetry is again you see this the way the definition is either both of them x z and y z in the language or none of them is in the language. So, this definition the way we are saying is symmetric. So, this is true and finally, transitivity let us check. Okay. Suppose that x r l y and y r l z right and what I need to show that I would like to show that if x r l y and y r l z, then x r l z. Now, the reason for that is you take any string w now, because so x r l z will be true if both the strings x w x w and z w satisfy this condition. Now, let us say x w is in the language, right. Then from this fact what do you get since x is related to y. So, suppose x w is in the language implies y w is also in the language and now from the fact that y is related to z, I get z w is also in the language right. And actually this is an if and only if statement. x w in the language because of this condition I can say if and only if y w is in the language and y w is in the language and because of y being related to z, if and only if z w is in the language. So, what I have is x w is in the language, if and only if z w is in the language. So, x r l z. So, it is clear that r l is an equivalence relation and just to fix our ideas, let me just uh, consider an old language that we had considered before. So, let us say L is the set of finite binary strings such that x has even number of zeros and even number of So, now of course, sigma is the binary alphabet 0 1. So, now consider x to be some string let us say 0 1 1 0 1 and y to be 1 0 1 0 
will they be in the language? Uh, or rather, of course, we know that both of them 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, this is not in the language, because this has even number of zeros, but odd number of ones and this has odd number of zeros and even number of ones. So, both are not in the language. So, that is ok, but we would like to know if x r l z. So, you see just consider the string uh, sorry x r l y. These two strings x and y, y we are considering and we would like to know if x r l y holds or not for this language l. Now, actually x r l y is not true does not hold. Why? Because just consider this string z to be 1. So, when you get x z that will be the string. So, write x z here 0 1 1 0 1 and then 1 x z is in the language, because it has even number of 1s and even number of zeros. This is in the language and now take y z, y z is what? 1 0 0, 1 0, 1 0 0 and then z again 1. This has odd number of 1s and odd number of zeros, so this is not in the language. So, that shows that these two strings 0 1 1 0 1 and 1 0 1 0 0 these two strings are not related by the relation R L for the language L. On the other hand if you take uh, another example for the same language L that is the context supposing I say uh, 0 1 0 and 1 1 1. It is you need to argue, but you should be able to see if, for example, any string that you take see the point is this. This has even number of zeros and odd number of 1 this string also has even number of zeros and odd number of ones right now for this string to become a string in the language after augmenting some z that z must have even zeros and odd ones so that together they have even number of zeros and even number of ones. So, now if you add the same string here, what will happen? This already had odd number of ones, you added through this string some more ones. So, two odd number of ones when you add them, their number becomes even. So, the total number of ones will become even here. And since here it is even of no zeros and only zeros are here. So, again the together this entire string will have even number of zeros and even number of ones. So, whenever this string is going to be in the language by adding some w that same w also will make this string when added this w when added to the string to the right that string also will be in the language. And similarly, we should be able to argue that any string, if it you know, if you take any w, if that w does not make the entire string in the language, that case is will be the case if and only if same w when added will not make the string in the language. So, you see what I am trying to say for this language L the two strings 0 1 0 is related by this relation r. Okay. 
we are more or less clear about the relation R L and you should be able to see that this R L is defined for any language L whatsoever, because you know we just follow the definition. So, and this is an equivalence relation therefore, it will partition sigma star in some equivalence class. Now, what the statement 3 is saying that this R L is a finite index, right. So, let us prove this that if 2 is true that implies 3. We now prove that the statement 2 implies statement 3, right. So, you see statement 2 is saying that we have a language L in sigma star such that there is, so this is sigma star. What this language L is? L is the union of some of the equivalence classes of an equivalence relation on sigma star satisfying these two conditions that that equivalence relation is right invariant and it is of finite index. So, let that equivalence relation be r dash. Now, first of all it says that one of the things it says that r dash is a finite index and r dash is an equivalence relation. So, therefore, it partitions the set sigma star in some manner, right. So, these are the equivalence classes induced on sigma star by the relation r dash. And two things we know already one that the very fact that it is it is inducing this partition of course, means r dash is an equivalence relation we have made use of that. Two other things is r dash is right invariant and r dash is of finite index, which means the number of equivalence classes for r, da r dash is finite. So, this number of such equivalence classes is finite and now we are saying that L is the union of some of the equivalence classes. So, the language is solely consists of you take some equivalence classes entirely ok. Maybe this one also. This is just a picture of course. So, the statement 2 is saying that my language consists of the union of these strings and these strings and these strings. And now, from here I would like to show that that language L, which is the union of some of the equivalence classes of r dash, where r dash is an equivalence relation which is right invariant and it is a finite index. That language L, for that language L, if I consider r L, r L is of finite index. This I need to now prove and which will show the implication 2 to 3. Well, the proof is by showing that any such r dash is a refinement of r l. We defined refinement last time and to prove that r dash is a refinement of r l, what I need to show that is 
if x r dash y that means, whenever two strings are related by r dash that means, take any two strings in any one of these equivalence classes that would imply these two strings are also related by r l. This is what I need to do. So, of course, I know from the definition so let us that this will be true if I can show remember it is just the definition x r l y holds if and only if for all z x z and y z these two strings either both in L or neither it is. Okay. So, now consider the two strings x z and y z. because r dash is right invariant, I immediately have x r dash y. If I take any z, it is the case because the relation r dash is right invariant, what I have is x z is also related by r dash to y z. That follows that is something which follows directly from the definition of R z. Right. Now, suppose x z is in the language. That means, what? That x z is either here or it is here or it is here, because remember the language L is the union of some of the equivalence classes of R dash. So, suppose x z is here. Now, what is R dash saying? R dash is saying that x x z and y z of course, since they are related that means, y z also is in the same equivalence class. So, if x z falls here being we have assumed x z is in the language. So, it is in one of these dashed equivalence classes and now since it is all related by r dash y z is also in the same equivalence class, which means if you assume x z is in L that implies y z is in L. It cannot be the case that x z is in L and y z not in L. Right, And of course, this is true the other way also that if you assume y z in L, then the same argument shows that x z will also be L in L. Therefore, if x z is not in L, y z also cannot be in L. So, that shows what? That whenever x is related to y by this r dash, I can find no z such that exactly one of x z and y z will be in the language, the other not in the language. Therefore, clearly x is related to y by r l as well and that proves that r dash is a refinement of r l. Now, remember our notion of refinement. If something is a refinement of some other equivalence relation, what does it mean? We, we, we discussed that last time. It just means that R dash at most breaks up some of the equivalence classes of R L into new equivalence classes. Right? In other words, the equivalence classes of R L are made up of by made up by combining some of the equivalence classes entirely of R dash. Now, what does that mean? That number of equivalence classes of R L is less than equal to the number of equivalence classes of R dash. 
right? Because R dash equivalence classes are made up by breaking apart some of the equivalence classes of R A. So, now if since R dash is of finite index, that is what 2 says, R L also has to be of finite index, and that proves this that is indeed the statement 3 that R L is of finite index. Once more, the our idea was in this proof, we made this assumption and let R dash be such an equivalence relation. Then we show that R dash is a refinement of R L and since R dash is a refinement of R L, number of equivalence classes of R L is no more than the number of equivalence classes of R dash and since R dash itself was a finite index that is it has finitely many equivalence classes, R L will also have finitely many equivalence classes and therefore, R L is of finite index. To complete the proof of myhill nerode theorem, we now need to show that 3 implies 1, the statement 3 implies 1. Right. So, what is statement 3 saying? that I have a language L and the relation R L is of finite index. From here, I would like to show to show R L is the language L is regular. So, from the assumption that R L is of finite index, we need to show the language L is regular. And the way we will show the language L is regular by actually constructing or defining a DFA for L using this relation R L. So, here is a definition of M a DFA using the equivalence relation R L and uh, we will show that this DFA M which we are going to define now will accept the language M. So, first of all my DFA M is going to be as usual q sigma delta q 0 and f. I mean I need to tell what this q delta q 0 and f are. Sigma is of course, I know that sigma is the language, uh, sigma is the alphabet L is defined over. Now, we define q to be the set of equivalence classes of the equivalence relation R A. Now, Let me use this part of the board. Remember that we, our assumption is R L is of finite index. Now, R L is an equivalence relation on sigma star, the set of all strings over sigma, and uh, what more, R L is of finite index. So, the number of equivalence classes R L induces on sigma star, that number is finite. Now, what we are saying is that I will have an equivalence class standing for a state of my DFA. 
if you might like to think of this way that for every equivalence class, so this is R L induced partition of sigma star and these are the equivalence classes example of course, just a picture and so I would like to say that these I have a state of the DFA for this, for this, for this, for this. So, in this case here there are 1, 2 in this picture there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 equivalence classes. So, in such a case Q will consist of 7 states. The Q will have seven elements. Now, I think you know what what each of these equivalence classes consist of. They consist of strings, right? Now, how does one denote an equivalence class? One way of denoting is that take any element here. Let us say x, which is a string and you might remember that x denote. So, let me in fact write this. So, for any x in sigma star, the, this is the standard notation that this denotes, which is this stands for the equivalence class to which x belongs. So, my definition for q therefore, is of this machine m, I can write q to be like this in this manner. Although it looks that for every x in sigma star I am doing something, but the number of these equivalence classes is finite because that is what I have. My statement 3 said that R L is of finite index, therefore, there are only finitely many equivalence classes. So, this set the right hand side set is finite and therefore, we can take that set to be the set of states. All right. So, after that how do I define delta? Now, remember the way we define the transition function is what was delta for, for any DFA? Delta was a mapping from Q cross sigma to Q. In other words, Q if it is if, if delta will look like this that it will take a state, it will take a symbol and it will tell me what does the DFA, which state the DFA goes to from state Q on symbol A. We will define delta. Now, as I said the delta takes two arguments, one is a state and one is a symbol. So, our states are of this kind equivalence classes of R L. So, let us say I have this state and the symbol is A. Right? Then we define it to be that state to which the string x a belongs. Now, this definition looks all right. However, we need to ensure one thing. Remember that equivalence class x consists of many strings. So, suppose y is also here. So, in other words, the equivalence class x is same as the equivalence class of y. So, the way we are doing it of course, that this equivalence class we are representing by the string x, you know, while we write like this, 
this equivalence class we are representing by an element of the equivalence class. And then we said that this is the equivalence class and the state corresponding to that is the state to which my machine will go if it is in this state and the symbol A comes. The natural question therefore, is that since the state is same whether you represent it as this or this that is the equality this is the same state because this is the same equivalence class. Then this for this definition to be what we call this definition to be well defined. It must be the case that if I had taken some other representative for the class let us say y in this case that delta y and then a of course, by this definition I will get y a they must be same x a and y a must be same only then this definition is meaningful otherwise it is meaningless right. As it turns out that will be the case why remember what do we know of x and y that they belong to the same equivalence class of R A. So, in other words let me now write it here I am trying to prove my definition this is the definition of delta and that definition is done properly. It does not depend on which representative of the equivalence class I take and that is why I am saying in order to make this particular definition you know to, to, to convince you that this is a proper definition I need to show this that given that there is another string y in the same equivalence class. So, that is why we are writing the equivalence class of x is same as equivalence class of y and this I should show that the equivalence class of x a is same as the equivalence class of y a given that x and y belong to the same equivalence class. Now, x and y belong to the same equivalence class means this that is the definition they are related by R L and this will be the case if x a also I can show to be related to y. Now, to show this that x a is related by the same relation y a uh, related by the same relation to y a. I need to show that for any z x a z and y a z whenever x a z is in the language this means if and only if y a z is also in the language right. Now, remember x a z x a z is in the language. Now, consider this as the entire string a z which you are appending to which you are concatenating to x. Now, since x and y are related x with this string appended if that is in L since x is related to y then y a z also will be in the language and vice versa. So, therefore, it is indeed the case that x r l y implies x a r l y a and therefore, this definition is well I mean it, it is well defined right. So, we have done that. So, my definition for delta is complete and in order to show what the machine is I need to provide the definitions for q 0 and f. Now, what is q 0? q 0 is the state initial state where the machine begins. Now, it should not be too difficult to see intuitively that if I take 
q 0 to b that state or that equivalence class to which the string epsilon belongs. Remember epsilon is the empty string and epsilon will be in one of these class one of these equivalence classes that equivalence class is the initial state of the machine. See, we, we are you know we, we have considered that equivalence classes of R L they constitute the states of the machine name. Right? So, please keep that in mind. So, at one level we are talking of equivalence classes which which are strings, but at the other level we are thinking in terms of that this entire equivalence class is a state and takes a little while may be to appreciate this, but really there is no difficulty. Think of the way we have done it here. At least q you can see it, there will be finitely many elements delta this is the way we have defined makes sense. So, this also makes sense that q 0 is something q 0 is a state of the machine m and so therefore, it has to be an equivalence class of R l because the, that machine m the states of the machine m are the equivalence classes of R l and we are defining the initial state to be that equivalence class to which the empty string belongs. Now, we will show of course, that this makes sense, but before that let me complete the definition and finally, the set f, f is a subset of q remember this the final states. So, this I put it this way all those equivalence classes such that. So, you see we are what we are saying again x is in the language of course, language is infinite that is fine, but you think of you these strings which are in the language the, there are only finitely many equivalence classes. So, they will distribute to some of these equivalence classes those are the classes they when thought of as states of the machine m are my final states of the machine. So, this is a definition, but does it make sense? First of all, does this machine as we have as we have defined, does it accept the language L? That is what I need to show, right? We need to show that 3 implies 1, and in that, starting from the definition of R L, I define this machine m, but ultimately what I need to show that this machine m the language accepted by this machine m I need to show that this language is nothing but the language l. Well, look at it this way. So, first of all let me show that if I take a string in the language then that string will be accepted by this machine m let us see how. So, suppose x is in the language and the string x consists of a 1, a 2, a n. These are the symbols, the string is of length n and this uh, string x is consists of this symbol c 1 a 2 up to a n. Now, how does the machine behave on this string? Initially, the machine is in this state epsilon, then the symbol a 1 comes. right? Now, look at the definition of delta, if it is in that state epsilon, then a came, what is the next state? It will be in this state, the state to which the string a 1 belongs, then the machine m will be in this state. Now, a 2 came the machine will be in this state by definition, by definition of r delta. So, now finally, the machine after scanning all these symbols, these n symbols it will be in this state. 
this string a 1 through a n is accepted provided this state is a final state. But of course, that is the case, because since this is an element, the string is in the is an element in L is a lang is is one of the strings in the language. So, you replace a 1 a 2 a n here that is in the language. So, therefore, this state this state will be a final state. So, this proof is very simple we just followed the definition and what we see finally, we are in this state and that state is of course, a final state. So, this is accepted. Now, what what else to what what actually I have shown is that this language L is a subset of L m, right? Because that's what I just showed that you take any string in the language, that string will be accepted by that machine, right? Now, what about the other way? I need to show that L m is a subset of the language L. One way of proving that is that if I take a string which is not in the language, then I should show this machine the DFA that I have defined will go to a state which is not a final state. right? So, you know this is like this right. This I, I am trying to show this part. So, what I need to show that starting from x in L, I mean starting from x in L m, I should show that the string x is in the language and now use the contra positive of the statement that con, which is this I can show one way of showing this is saying that if x is not in the language, I should be able to show that x is not in L m. In other words, if I take a string which is not in the language, then I sh if I manage to show that string does not take the machine to a final state, then I am done. So, again, again the thing is very simple. Supposing that string now, let us say a 1, a 2, a n is not in the language L. So, how would the machine behave on this string? The same way that we had shown at the end of this string, when this string is scanned by my machine M, that will be in this state. But this is a string which is not in the language, right. And so, therefore, this is not one of the final state, it, this, 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 this equivalence class to which this string belongs is not one of the final states of the machine, because by definition the final states of the machine is all those equivalence classes which are consi which consist of strings which are in the language. Now, you might wonder see this is again it looks kind of we are just uh, you know waving hands and proving things, but this proof is rigorous. You might wonder what if I have a string, I have an equivalence class of R L, like can it happen that x is in the language and y is not in the language, can't ever happen, because consider this just the string epsilon x epsilon will be in the language, but y epsilon will not be in the language and that would mean that x and y could not be in the same equivalence class. So, really really one of the ways R L one of the implications of the definition of R L is the language L consists entirely of the union of that is you know some of these equivalence classes we take their union and that gives me the language. So, it cannot be that some strings from here and some strings from here 
will be in the language L that we can you can prove and therefore, all that makes sense what we said and that completes the proof that 3 the statement 3 of my hill Neroda theorem implies 1 just to just to wrap up we started with the assumption for a language L to have R L which is of finite index. That means, it has finitely many equivalence classes. From there, I defined a DFA and then I showed that DFA accepts that same language L. So, therefore, 3 statement 3 was R L is of finite index and statement 1 was L is regular and that is proved because my DFA that I defined this M that I defined this is the definition of the M that indeed accepts the language L. And you see the, the nice thing about one of the very important things this theorem tells me is what? Is that the notion of minimization of state. Let us see why so. My Hill Neroda theorem tells me what is the minimized automata, what will be the minimized automata, minimized DFA for a regular language L. You see, supposing L is regular, then that means that I have a DFA M such that L m the language accepted by that machine is the language L all right, by definition. And then if you consider R m what do I know that R m is a refinement of R l that was the statement of the the basically 1 implies 2 that that is what we said. Now, then that means what? Whatever machine that you may take, that machine the states number of states cannot be more than oh sorry cannot be less than equal to the number of states of number of states of the of the DFA that we defined through R L once more. You recall that from the definition of R L gives me a DFA for M dash for L. And if you if you if you just go back to the statements of the Michael Neroda theorem, what you know, what you can see immediately that any machine M accepting L, the number of states in that machine has to be equal to or more than the number of states defined through R L DFA. So, you remember we, we just used a DFA definition from R L. Now, minimization of states will be coming to the DFA which corresponds to R L. From R L that definition of the DFA that we got that is indeed the best DFA in terms of number of states and this is what we will follow up in our 